Sam's front yard. <laughs> now you can see where I get my love of gardening from, right? Yeah, isn't that pretty? That Japanese maple, it's absolutely gorgeous. Everybody thought she was nuts because she was the only person on the block that put a garden on her front lawn, but wow, absolutely gorgeous. She has her little secret garden in there with the walkway. Several times throughout the day, while well, my mother is sitting in her garden, in her queendom. She wakes up and she finds herself in this beautiful garden. wonders, how did I get so lucky? How did I get to be so blessed to be in this beautiful house in this beautiful garden? How did I get here? is that she bought this house when she was 60 years old. she was 71. And in those 11 years, she put every penny that she had into creating a beautiful home and a beautiful garden. And today, without realizing it, she reaps the rewards of every seed that she has ever sown.
It's interesting, my mother remembers me with blonde hair. I haven't had blonde hair in, I don't know how long, Jude. I was 43, I'm 57. So what's that, 13 years? She's lost 13 years with her memory. She says she's never been to my brother's. She doesn't remember that because that's within the last 13 years. It's interesting. The more I'm here, the more alive she seems to be in that time frame that she's in. She seems to have more life. Yeah, she's very forgetful. But even in her best days, she couldn't always, it's like me, can't remember all the names of everything all the time. Not on an instant recall. It takes a little while, right? And then she finally remembered hydrangea. Because at one point in time, she was, oh my God, madly in love with hydrangeas. My mother never stopped to think when she was young that she'd have a house and a garden like this. And just like in this moment, I never thought that I'd be seeing my mother as an old woman and me as an aging woman. And recognizing so profoundly where I am in the circle of life. And to hear her talk so lovingly about my father. and knowing with almost a certainty that they will return to each other and that there will be an invitation for me to return. This is the whole how we keep the ancestral spirit lineage alive and we re recycle into different stories. Just like, you know, the story of this garden is here, but then where does it go in the winter? That it's just roots, most of it. Where does it go? And then it comes back, just like magic. Same garden, but different garden, you know what I mean? It's kind of like reincarnation, I think. I've never... I don't think I've ever felt this much gratitude for my parents in all the years I've been alive. And I'm 100% certain that mom's right that that is a poplar and not a birch. What I remember about trees, although it was sold to us as a poplar or as a birch, but somehow it needed to be the poplar. It's the right medicine for here. And it withstands the test of time. When my mother turned 70, I asked her to write a small article on her experience with gardening. And that is the story that I will now share. My garden has developed over the past 10 years and is still not finished. It will never be finished. It will continue to grow and change as long as I do. It began as a 30 by 40 foot backyard with nothing in it but grass and a couple of neglected shrubs. But I had a vision. In my mind, I could picture a beautiful garden, and I set out to make it a reality. Some might say it was an impossible pie-in-the-sky dream, but I've always been a dreamer. And when I dream, I dream big. Making a garden for me was not an easy task. I had neither the knowledge, the money to make it happen. I wasn't able to hire a landscape architecture or bring in any heavy equipment. What I did have was willpower, determination, and a dream, plus, I must confess, some free labor donated by my family. I began to collect the information from books, magazines, and television gardening shows. I came to realize that the style of garden that most appealed to me was based roughly the English cottage style. I wanted a jumble of plants that bloomed at various times of the year and returned to bloom again the following year. 
My love affair with perennials began. I was hooked on them and began to learn everything that I could about them. I had no interest whatsoever in annuals that bloomed continuously all summer. To me, that was boring. I wanted the challenge of finding plants that provide me with a changing palette of color throughout the year. My first small garden was at the back of the house where the deck now stands. It consisted of a few plants and bulbs, but when I first put a shovel in the ground and witnessed the beauty that emerged, I realized that what I thought might be a small hobby would evolve into a consuming and passionate love affair. When my son built the deck the following year, I had to rescue the plants and make a place for them to grow. This was the beginning of the large garden that now takes up most of my backyard. This was also the beginning of an obsession that has taken over my life. Beds were laid out with the help of a garden hose. With the aid of a shovel and a wheelbarrow, sod was laboriously removed and piled green side down at the back of the garden shed, which, by the way, took up most of the space on the south side of the house. I silently begrudged the utilitarian use of this valuable garden space. Having learned a great deal about sun-loving plants, I thought it was a total waste of good earth. However, being unable to remove the albatross, I continued to dig and pile the sod at the back of it. What began as a small pile of earth grew into a massive rectangular heap of dirt that resembled a burial site. I'm sure the neighbors must have thought that I was crazy, and maybe I was a little. It took a couple of years for the sod to break down into usable compost, which then had to be put back into the garden beds. Mountains of peat moss and manure were dug in, with the help of my children, who I'm sure thought of it as slave labor. Plants were added a few at a time, and gradually my little plot of land began to resemble a garden. I was not content with this for long, however, and began to imagine a garden that surrounded the entire yard, and so I continued to dig. The site posed numerous problems that had to be overcome, not the least of which is the lay of the land. The yard slopes towards the house with a steep bank along the back fence. When the snow melts in the spring, the water drains towards the house and lies on the lawn for some time leaving it a soggy mess. I had given a great deal of thought to this problem, but as yet have been unable to solve it. There are two reasons for this, one being the lack of funds, and the other being an enormous amount of work that it may entail. Recently, however, I have begun to research various solutions. At the back of the lot in the neighbor's yard is a giant maple tree that casts lovely afternoon shade for which I am very grateful. However, it sucks the life out of the soil on my side of the fence, and for years nothing would grow there except weeds. I have recently discovered some plants that will grow and even thrive in these conditions. There seems to be a plant suited to every environment, a fact that I find quite amazing. The big daddy shed on the south side of the house not only takes up valuable garden space as mentioned earlier, but it obstructs the view from the kitchen window. Since I can neither afford to remove or replace it, I had to come up with what I believed to be a creative way to make it more useful and less of an eyesore. After much thought, I decided to divide it in half. The front half would be for storage for garbage bins and general storage, and doors could be added to the back to create an efficient garden shed facing onto the garden. I recruited the help of my son-in-law for this project. Free labor, I might add. A walkway made of paving stones was put in place, and the far side of the shed along the fence became my compost area. A coat of paint finished the job. It works very well. The only problem remaining is how to screen the compost from the rest of the garden. I have decided to add a structure and cover it with vines. Not that I'm a lawn person, but I would like a small patch of grass that I have left to remain green. This summer, however, millions of dandelions took up residence there. What began as a battle turned into an all-out war. The casualties are there for all to see. Yellow patches of dead grass where the enemy once flourished. To my dismay, as I surveyed the damage, I realized that a few survivors lived to fight again. 
Last year, the neighbor to the south of me erected an eight-foot high fence along this side of my property, effectively turning what was once my only sun garden into a shade garden overnight. This was a terrible blow to my gardening ego. I had done all that research into sun-loving plants after all. The result was that I had to redesign that section of the garden and some of the shrubs perished. There is a bright side to all this, however. I can now grow rhododendrons. The front yard has always been a problem for me. The grass had to be cut. Not one of my favorite pastimes. Besides, it was difficult to get the lawnmower up over the railroad ties that enclosed it. Solution? Remove the offending railroad ties and the grass. The first task was tackled by my eldest son, the latter by me. I also removed several wheelbarrow loads of dirt that I dumped in the back garden. This served two purposes. It lowered the front garden, making it more suitable to planting, and the sandy soil from the front helped to break up the clay in the back, killing two birds with one stone, so to speak. This also gave me the opportunity to design what I believe to be a very attractive front garden with a bench and a bird bath. My son helped me lay a low drywall of stone around the garden. Peat, moss, and manure were dug in. Plants and shrubs were carefully placed, and an attractive garden began to take shape. This process took the better part of three years to complete. I'm sure that I'm not the only one happy to see the finished product. It has become the first of its kind in the neighborhood, garnering various opinions from the neighbors, I'm sure. After all, it's breaking the rules, but I was never a stickler for the rules. I decided that the back garden had no sense of mystery, a vital component to a well-designed garden. The solution was to make an island bed and fill it with shrubs, which, when fully grown, might help to conceal the view of the entire garden. This project took no time at all. The shrubs are flourishing and when fully grown will serve the purpose for which they were intended. They are beautiful to the garden. A few more well-placed shrubs and the effect will be complete. I have added a secret garden with a bench, a couple of chairs beside a bird bath in the shade of the male tree, and a swing under the birches by the deck. I believe that a garden should be enjoyed as well as worked in. They provide a wonderful place to relax and get inspiration. I have learned a lot about gardening over the years. I have learned that a garden is not just flowers. It is trees and shrubs and insects and birds and worms and wildlife. I have learned that although flowers are beautiful, they last only a short time. It is really the leaves that makes a garden interesting. I now pay attention to leaves, their color, shape, and texture, and the way they play off one another. I have learned that a garden needs structure for year-round interest and to frame the view in much the same way as a door or a window frames the view. It needs focal points to draw the eye and places to rest the eye. It needs evergreens for winter interest and to provide the bones of the garden. I have learned that a garden takes time. It knits together slowly over time. Gardening has taught me a great deal about life and about myself. I have learned that if you are creative, you can accomplish a great deal with what you have. My hard work is rewarded when the first flower appears on each plant, and I marvel at its beauty. The love of gardening can inspire neighbors to get to know each other as they exchange information and plants over the fence. It brings a sense of community to a neighborhood. Gardening reminds me that I have very little control in the grand scheme of things, and that I need to have faith in something other than myself. Plants will grow and flourish in their own time, or not. I can move them, feed them, water them, and prune them into submission. But in the end, they will do their own thing, much like people will. A garden is always changing. This is what I love about it. It is full of surprises that delight the senses and feed the soul. It makes me realize that change is inevitable. It is a part of life. I can struggle to resist it or give myself over to it with grace and dignity. People look at my garden and comment on the amount of work involved. I must admit, it has been a lot of work, but the pleasure it has brought me over the years more than compensates for that. It doesn't feel like work to me. It is a most enjoyable form of exercise, creativity, joy, and peace. I see it as a spiritual place where I can rejuvenate my soul. 
It helps me to slow down and see the beauty in the smallest of creatures. It gives me a sense of being one with the universe and makes me realize just how fragile and precious life is.